everyone, it's your favorite ABBA super fan here. And now, after officially watching both Mamma Mia and Mamma Mia, here we go again. An unhealthy amount of times, I feel overly qualified to bring you my official list of literally every song from Mamma Mia and Mamma Mia 2, ranked in order from worst to best. After scoring each song on a scale of 1 to 10 in the categories of narrative significance, how well it lives up to the ABBA original track in terms of quality and arrangement, and then finally, how hard it hits on either an emotional impact level or entertainment value. Balancing each song's totals with my irrefutable wisdom on all things Mamma Mia, I was able to compile an indisputable list of all 41 songs. There's a lot of music to go through here, so let's grind through this as fast as I can. Ready, go! Name of the game 100% deserves the bottom spot on this list. This arrangement is terrible, the scene is hilariously awkward and makes no sense. It's almost like Sophie was trying to seduce Bill. Thank the Lord they cut this from the movie. While I wonder would have been cool if the movie had anything to do with introducing Donna's personality and the journey of self-discovery, the movie isn't about that in the slightest. It's about her being dead. So thankfully this poopy diaper of a scene was cut. Ah yes, exactly what this movie needs. James Bond creepily fantasizing over a bikini Lily James. I don't need your nostalgia movie. Give me new songs. Sky and Sophie's relationship troubles as a side plot is so insignificant and irrelevant in Mamma Mia 2, so why did they have to ruin one of my favorite ABBA songs with their shitty voices while meandering about a bland set? Holy jeez, this scene is so bad. And also, how do you not incorporate Ring Ring into this moment? It's a song about a phone call. Regardless, I shouldn't waste any more of my time on this. There's lots more to rant about. Moving on. Thank You For The Music is a fan-pleasing song they crammed into this movie just so it could be on the soundtrack. Thanks, I guess, but also no thanks. Who would have thought a song all about having a great time ends up killing all the fun we were having during the previous Super Trooper and Lay All Your Love On Me scenes. Also, I would prefer if this movie didn't try to rape Bill and Harry. Thanks. Thank you At least this time, the song has relevance as Sophie sings it for her mother, but dedicating the first minute of a film to subpar acapella vocals? Hard pass. Really, Hollywood? You're gonna waste the talent of Andy Garcia on one scene where he turns out to be some random guy named Fernando, so that an also unnecessarily casted Cher gets to sing the song you used to sell the trailer? And then she butchers it anyway. And so you cover it up with so much CGI fireworks that they might have blown up the CGI moon. Ugh. Title song shoved into the movie because no one would see it otherwise. Really, Donna? Sing how you feel? Why not sing So Long? Or Bang a Boomerang? Either of those are about as lyrically relevant as Mamma Mia is in this moment. I Have a Dream is the thematic centerpiece of the Mamma Mia franchise. Makes sense in terms of defying Sophie's character goals at the beginning of the film, but the vocals don't live up to the original. Also, a pretty boring song and pretty boring start to the movie. If anything, I prefer this orchestral arrangement of The Day Before You Came over the ABBA original version. But I am biased here because Meryl Streep could fart the entirety of Ice Ice Baby and I would still praise her for it. Oh boy! Another song the studio crammed into this film because they knew people would be upset if it wasn't in. Lily James sells it though, no matter how paper thin her role in this movie is. ABBA has so many great songs, so why did they have to choose this one to be the emotional anthem of their movie franchise? At least the moments of parallelism between the past and present is kinda cool. Although the idea behind adding this song is to capture Donna's independence as a single mother and hotel owner, it also depicts her as a lazy gold digger. Confusing? Yes, I know. Do you want another one? Do you want another one? No, not really, because I guess Universal had to fit Waterloo somehow into this movie since it doesn't have any relevance to the plot. Uh-huh, would you like some cheese with that cheese? Yes, please. This time, the studio basically said, okay, we have to cram this song somehow into this movie if we want to make any money off it at all. And that's what it felt like. This moment would have worked so much better if they asked Hugh Skinner to shove an entire baguette down his throat, which in the end, now that I think of it, would have been a great way to foreshadow his later coming out of the closet. The amount of passion displayed in this scene is about as cold as the French invasion of Russia, but the Napoleonic Wars are no laughing matter, so I'll stop while I'm ahead. Wait, why did Abba write a song about the Battle of Waterloo again? This scene is such a hard nostalgia song for all those diehard ABBA fans in the audience. A good time had by all thanks to Meryl Streep, Julie Walters, and Christine Baranski. God, I just love them so much. Ugh, I hate that they knew I was going to eat up this song like an idiot the second time around. How could they take a song that was so irrelevant in the first movie and spin it to be even more irrelevant? If anything, I'm impressed. 
I actually surprisingly enjoy this moment in the film. The arrangement fits the tone of the scene and does a good job of taking us into concluding the emotional epitome of the story. Hmm, what does a song celebrating pedophilia have to do with anything? Uh, literally nothing. But they want to have a rip-roaring time at graduation and that's what they did. Good for them, I guess. Sam so obviously loved Donna, but she was so distracted by Jeremy Irvine's awful vocals that she couldn't see it. Also, maybe if he wasn't such a chiseled god of a man, Donna would have forgiven him for not telling her about the engagement. This is why I personally choose to be ugly. All aboard the rape boat. Josh Dillon is way too attractive to be in this movie. At least this song does justice and hooray for beautiful water shots. They were surprisingly able to fit this song into the movie while also giving it some lyrical relevance to the plot. But otherwise, Lily James prancing about an orange orchard is boring and does nothing to move the story along. I really appreciate how the chaos of voulez vu mixes with the mess that Sophie has laid upon herself. One, by rushing into a wedding that she's not ready for just so she can discover which of three strangers is her father, and two, telling all those strangers that they get to be a physical part of what will soon be the biggest change in her life, a decent rendition of a decent song to signify the halfway point of the film. Also, more hot guys swinging in unexpectedly on vines, please. Christine Baranski is literally so much fun as she stomps through a sea of hot 20 year olds as she barely bats an eye. Her absolute savagery as she exudes pure sex towards these tools almost makes you forget that this song is about pedophilia. Wait, how many songs about pedophilia did Abba write? Yo, this guy rules. One might say his kisses put the fire in everything, but it's too bad the rest of the cast extinguishes it. If Panos sang every song in both movies, they probably would have swept the Oscars. I'm just saying, this is so much missed potential. Even though Pierce Brosnan can't sing for his life, he somehow does this song justice. His cheesiness is the only reason I slightly care at all about his and Donna's relationship at the end. Otherwise, I couldn't give a hoot. This scene is so goofy that it works. 10 golden eyes out of 10. Again, the Pierce Brosnan cheese is just too good. Hard not to love his dorkiness. Also, it's just a fun contextual moment to shift a song that isn't originally about a marriage into one that fits a proposal. But it just reminds me about how Colin Firth never gets his own song in either movie. Ugh, Colin Firth is just such a beautiful man. There's just so much missed potential there. I love how the lyrics to Honey Honey mix with what we now are discovering to be Donna's past loves. Confusing and creepy though, as Sophie sings and fantasizes about her mother's sexual slutty history. Extra points for opening the movie with beautiful shots of the water. Minus points though for the bitch wearing the Duke shirt. The lyrics to this song and this short scene of reminiscing about the 70s does a much better job at showing how much Donna's infectious legacy affected the lives of three dads and the entire sequel prequel thing. I just can't get enough of Colin Firth and Pierce Brosnan trying to sing though. Really feeds into the corniness that made this a cult film. Take a Chance on Me wraps up the random cheese fest that was Mamma Mia, a reminder that story doesn't have to take itself too seriously in order to have an entertaining movie, no matter how ridiculous or nonsensical. Tanya and Rosie transition us into the good part of Mamma Mia 2, and it also reincarnates all the fun that we had in the first Mamma Mia film. And they're singing one of my favorite ABBA songs of all time. This scene is hilarious, ironically, due to the poor directing of Al Parker, but also mostly to the high energy and charisma of Christine Baranski and Julie Walters not taking this movie nearly as seriously as it was trying to be. Which brings me back to why is there not more Christine Baranski and Julie Walters in this sequel? I Have Been Waiting For You is surprisingly heartfelt as it flashbacks to Donna giving birth with no one but Aunt Sophia by her side, recapturing the magic of Donna's character as a single mom whose independence is both a strength and a weakness that she devoted her whole life to raising her daughter the way that her mother never did. Grandma Cher is just another fan-pleasing moment that adds nothing to the movie outside of her presence. Another huge missed opportunity to really show the relationship dynamics, remorse, and growth between generations. The Chikatita scene captures the love and friendship between Tanya, Rosie, and Donna, portraying how much their friendship of the dynamos means to Donna. No matter how hard she tries to be strong, how they would always be together through anything. Something that isn't really touched on at all in Mamma Mia 2. Wow, Meryl just nails it again. Give her a gosh darn award already for heaven's sake. Jeez, she just doesn't have enough. Wow, and look at that water. And look at that church. And look at James Bond taking Donna's rant like a bitch. 
The level of cheese in this scene is explosive. If you were taking this movie seriously at any point, you stopped right here to bop along while admiring the chiseled bodies of dancing hunks and flippers on the sunset docks. All right, by raise of hands, who else is disappointed the three fathers didn't look anything like this in Mamma Mia 2? Donna creeping around the barn trying to catch a glimpse of a personified good old days, the goofy extras in the background, and Donna falling vag first onto the floor at the end make this the perfect scene. Sophie ending up having the sixth sense and being able to sing to her mother at her own child's baptism is everything I could have wanted in a finale. Beautifully shot, the best vocals in the movie by far, and concludes the film on the right thematic note. Here's a fact for you, the studio actually contemplated and planned a murdering of Meryl Streep in order to sell this movie and what would later be a Devil Wears Prada sequel for the summer of 2020. Every moment of slipping through my fingers captures the heart of this musical, that of the relationship between a mother and daughter who discovered themselves through each other and built each other up into the wonderful women they are today. It was never about the wedding or the fathers, it was about a mother's love for her child. Okay, I'm not gonna lie to you, when I watched this movie in theaters, I screamed at the screen when they said that Harry and Sam weren't going to be coming to the island, and I cried tears of joy when they appeared striking the iconic I'm Flying Jack moment from Titanic with an armada of dancing Greeks. Now this is the Mamma Mia sequel I paid $10 for a movie ticket and $23 for the Blu-ray copy to see. The amount of cheese from all the original cast members on an enormous scale is everything I could have wanted in a movie. It's just too bad it took them an hour and a half to get there. The empowerment anthem that sparks an iconic island-wide women's march against all the men that thought they could control their lives. You don't need a man to be a queen. There's no shame in your past. Be yourself. Be free. Be a dancing queen. Agree or disagree with the overall rankings? Passionate about certain songs that didn't make it into the top 10? Feel free to comment below. Lord knows if I had time to make this video, I have time to converse with you guys.